This morning, I'm going to be looking at the television a lot because I left my notes at home. And so I'm hoping that that what comes up on TV is going to remind me what I'm supposed to be talking about. <laughs> no, I, I think I have a, I think I remember it. But like to quote scriptures is like I don't have all of um, all of these memorized. <laughs> so anyways, Father, we thank you that you do speak, <coughs> Lord, that that you are alive and active, that we can hear your word, that we can hear what you have to say to us now. And so, Lord, that's what we want to receive. Lord, whether or not I've got everything prepared in front of me, it it doesn't matter because what we really want is a word from you. And so, Lord, we pray that you will speak today. Lord, that we will hear your voice above everything else. And we praise and we exalt your name. Amen. Amen. So today I wanted to look at Solomon, who is usually considered to be the wisest man on earth. You know, the Bible talks about that, that he was the wisest man on earth. But if you actually look at the later part of his life, um, he stopped using his wisdom. So I was trying to think what to call it. So I was looking at this as um, the stupidity of the wisest man on earth <laughs> <laughs> is what I called this because uh, there's a difference between having wisdom and using wisdom, right? Because you can you could have all the wisdom that God gives you. In fact, we all we all do. If you're a believer, God has given you the mind of Christ, right? But there's a very big difference between having it and using it. Um, so I want to look at this first verse of Solomon, which is First Kings chapter ten, verses twenty-three through twenty-four. It says, "So King Solomon surpassed all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom." Now all the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. So Solomon, you know, this is kind of the verse here that proves like Solomon was the guy. Like he, and he wrote large portions of the Bible, like significant portion of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, uh, the Song of Solomon were, were written by Solomon. Like, you know, he wrote a large portion of scripture, you know, things that we have preserved forever in the Bible are a result of this man's wisdom, which was given to him by God. He got this wisdom. This is not just being a wise person. This was God actually giving him like full-blown wisdom. And in fact, Solomon was visited twice by God. Not only was he visited twice by God where, where basically he, uh, in one of the visits is when he actually gives him the wisdom. He asks him, what would I give to you for your kingdom? And He requests to be a wise leader. And then God blesses him not only with wisdom, but with all the things that normal people would ask for. Uh, But he was also visited by God another time. And then also when they did the blessing of the temple, Solomon got to experience the glory of the Lord filling the temple so strongly that it drove everybody out of the temple, (laughs) which which is a whole nother thing in and of itself. But I mean, like the power of God. So this is someone who has like really had some very amazing encounters with God, right? Um, But again, there's a difference between having that wisdom and actually using that wisdom. And so, yeah, there we go. Having the wisdom of God and using the wisdom of God are two completely separate matters. So he's, he's not only got this wisdom, but he's also got underneath him like experience. He's experienced God. He has seen the presence of God. He has moved in the power of God. He's heard God's voice. This is someone who's been very near to God, right? He's got some very strong promises running through his family, you know, and who was his father? King David, right? A man after God's own heart. And, you know, there's some, and then there were promises given to David to run through Solomon that are very powerful. Um, Go ahead and put the next thing up. The next verse, though, says this, and or not the next verse, but next thing I'm going to read. Mm-hmm. <laughs> is in 1 Kings 11, 6 through 11, it says, Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and did not fully follow the Lord as did his father David. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, on the hill that is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the people of Ammon. And he did likewise for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. So the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned from the Lord 
uh, from the Lord God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go. I'm almost pretty sure. Oh, <laughs> they should not go after. That makes more sense. That he, no, no, you're fine. That he should not go after other gods. But he did not keep what the Lord had commanded. Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this and have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Now, Solomon, up to this point, has not only been given wisdom, but like I said, he was given these other blessings. So Solomon becomes the wealthiest king. In fact, if you were to talk to people who are, say, Orthodox Jews and talk to them about the glory of Israel, they're going to go right back to Solomon. They're going to talk about how, you know, at that point, the kingdom of Solomon, the kingdom of Israel under Solomon, was the richest kingdom ever to exist on the earth. And actually, it still remains the wealthiest kingdom ever to exist on the earth. Like they have more money than any kingdom that has now. Like they they got it, they got it more. You know, Dubai has air conditioned their outdoors, <laughs> and Israel had more money than that. You have too much money when you start thinking about how you can air condition your outdoors. But anyways, <clears throat> but they had more. They had they had more abundance. They had more of everything, and and they're under just extreme blessing. And there's this blessing that has come through the line of David that someone would, would sit on the throne. Now, we know that that ends up being carried out through Jesus. So, you know, we're, all, we're cool there. But all of a sudden, Solomon's in this place where God is saying, I'm going to tear your kingdom away and give it to your servant. I'm ripping it out of your family line. I'm going to give it to your servant. How does Solomon go from one of the most just places of extreme blessing to now a place of cursing? Or how do you go from such a place of nearness to God? You know, it mentioned in that thing, he was visited twice by God. It doesn't even mention about, you know, the blessing of the temple where the presence of God filled it. How do you go from this place of nearness of God to all of a sudden building places of worship to other gods? And not just other gods, like the two that they listed, Shamash and Molech, are like gods that required child sacrifice. Like these are some of the most evil, like when they go through and ask like, who are the most evil of the false gods? Like these are the ones that come up, you know, throw in Baal also, if you want for good measure. No, that's all right. It's good for you to stay ahead of me because then, <laughs> then I know where I'm going. You can go ahead and put it up. So that's, that's one of the questions. So how, how did Solomon go from being super near to God and super blessed by God to being so far from God that he's willing to build places of worship to false gods and lose that blessing. And so we have this kind of innocuous verse here that sits in between those two passages. So we started in 1 Kings 10 and then we moved to 1 Kings 11. So now we're sort of at the end of 1 Kings 10. This is just sits right in the middle of like having great blessing and great cursing. It says, and Solomon had horses imported from Egypt in Keva. Keva? I don't know. Someplace. The king's merchants brought them in Keva at the current price. Now a chariot that was imported from Egypt cost 600 shekels of silver and a horse 150. And thus, through their agents, they ex exported them to all the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Syria. That's it. And the kings of Syria. <laughs> That's all right. So... This feels innocuous. Like here we are hearing about an economic lesson on what the cost of a chariot is and what the cost of a horse is. But there's a principle here because um, what Solomon forgot is something he already knew. Is God had commanded them not to have horses and chariots in Israel. In fact, what's I think the next verse maybe I'm hoping is about that. In Deuteronomy 17, 15 through 16, and Solomon would have known this. He was raised by David. They would have studied these passages. This is from the Torah. This is not some mystery scripture from anywhere. You know, the Israelite children, particularly someone that, you know, that's going to become king, would have studied the Torah. There's no chance he did not know this. It says, you shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses, one from among your brethren, and you shall set him as king over you, you may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother, but he shall not multiply horses for himself, 
nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses, for the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. And Keva, if I'm not mistaken, is in Egypt. And he's getting Egypt's... Yeah, oh, out of Egypt and Keva. So he's getting horses from Egypt. It's exactly what this scripture passage says not to do. You know, so totally he just disregarded something that he knew God had said. And it seems so innocent. Like this isn't, this isn't building an altar to a false God and sacrificing a child on it. You know, that this is not that level of evil. This was, I bought a horse and I bought a chariot. You know, it, it just feels very innocuous. Like, well, I mean, it says not to do it, but I mean, what's the harm, what's the harm in buying that horse or buying that chariot. Well, there's another verse that the Bible talks about horses and chariots. And the reason why God had that is in Psalm 27. And David actually wrote this. He said, some may trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord, our God. There are some weird things that God told people not to do in the Old Testament. Like what's the evil of buying a horse or buying a chariot? Well, the evil is this. Because if they have horses and chariots, which are symbols of war and power at that time, less so now, um, it would become easy to trust in that for your protection. There was also a, a command given not to take a census of the people. In other words, don't count how many people you have who are, are able-bodied fighters. We don't want to know how big the army is. Because again, you're going to put your trust as God. Here's the, here's the problem. If you have nothing, it's easier to trust in God because you have nothing. Therefore, I have to trust in God. But what happens when you start trusting in God and God starts pouring out his favor and blessing upon you? Then all of a sudden you have something. Does that mean that you now no longer have to trust in God? I mean, yeah, the obvious answer is no. But let's say I have no money. So I trust in God for finances. He blesses my finances. Now I have tons of money. This is what happens with Solomon. Do I now need to trust in God for my finances? Yes, yeah, the correct answer is yes. But, but what's, what's, our, what's the natural tendency is now that I have it, I forget to think about that as being from God. It's just there. I take it for granted, right? So this is what was happening with Solomon is he is starting to do some things that God has said don't do. And God had a real reason to not do it. Like, and it wasn't because horses are evil and it wasn't because chariots are evil. Taking a census isn't necessarily evil, but they were told not to do these things because God knows that our tendency is once you have it, that's where we're going to put our trust and not in him. And I am definitely confident that even though it never says, Solomon began to trust in his horses over God. That's not a verse in the Bible. It happened because we see that he began to stop trusting in God. The next thing that Solomon did is he surrounded himself with people who were not godly people. So in 1 Kings 11, 1 through 3, it says, But King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites, from the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, You shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. Yeah, no doubt. Not just surrounding himself, but like marrying people. And it says, you know, he clung to these in love. And when we read that passage about him building these altars to false gods, it said he did so for his wives. You know, he began to surround himself with the people God said, don't surround yourself with. Now, we have some commands in the New Testament that are given us things about don't be unequally yoked with an unbeliever or things like um, surround yourself with the body of believers. You know, there's all these verses but there's also verses that say, you know, you are in the world, not, but we're not of the world. So it's not like we isolate ourselves from people that don't believe like we do. 
where, you know, there's a certain amount of evangelism that needs to occur. There's that kind of thing. But they're not the people that we're surrounding ourselves in with for godly counsel. Yeah. We don't want to, like what Solomon did, is he, he married people that didn't share his faith. And God said, if you do this, they will turn your hearts away. We used to, in the 80s, when I was in youth group, they used to call it missionary dating. Like, <laughs> date a non-believer, and you think that you're going to turn them into a believer. And they called that missionary dating. And what the problem with it was that like 98% of the time, the person who thought that they were going to get the non-believer to start coming to church with them, they just stopped coming to church. And they just went after their relationship. Because it's part of the human heart. And that's why God has some of these things in here that's like, don't do this because this is what's going to happen. In fact, Proverbs is filled with things concerning stuff like this that Solomon himself wrote. <laughs> so he knew better. And now he's surrounding himself with ungodly people. What's the... um, this is actually the verse that was quoted in that last one, straight out of Deuteronomy and again out of the Torah. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself. He had said, what was it, 700 wives or seven, 700, 700 wives, 700, 300 concubines. Like he multiplied wives for himself. Lest he turn his heart away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. And an interesting one on there, neither shall he multiply silver and gold for himself. And this is also, by the way, specifically talking about the king, you know, putting who's going to be the king. And God's like, because I want to be the one that takes care of Israel, not the king. But if you remember when we talked about the horses and chariots, they gave the prices of it. And it actually shows how he ends up turning profit, doing trading and doing stuff with the spices and with the horses. And you can get into all this stuff, but just you know, you can go back and read it, but what I'll tell you is he multiplied silver and gold for himself. <laughs> so basically everything that says for a king not to do, Solomon did. But I think that the things that are the, the two takeaways that I have from this is number one, that he stopped doing the things that he knew to do. And then also he surrounded himself with ungodly people. And that's where the fall of Solomon came from, the result of these two things. Um, you know, God maybe has given us things that we know to do or things that we know not to do. Sometimes that's, that's things that are like kind of universal for everyone, sort of like what we're seeing here with Solomon. But sometimes it might be personal convictions, things that God has said, this is for you. And you might start off real good with it, but like, do we remember to do that? And then the second thing is, who are we really and truly surrounding ourselves with? Um, so in 1 Kings 11, 4, it says, For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. So what I was thinking of with this passage is time is actually can become an enemy to us. So Solomon got so used to living in the blessing and the abundance of God, that he began to take it for granted. Because this wasn't like he got given the blessing and then he, he married some women and immediately fell. This is when Solomon was old, basically as time passed, it may take a while, you know, then this stuff happened and he became not loyal to God. Like time does not heal all wounds. Actually, you know, time, time is just passes. Mm. Like <laughs> that's all time, time is. But there's a danger in like, there's a lot of people that I hear who will say things like, oh, I remember when I was young and on fire and impassioned for God. But then as you get older, you get caught up in life and you sort of flame out. And it's like, we don't want to do that. We want to have the same passion for God in fact, I, I don't even want the same passion for God that I had when I first met him. I want that passion to continue to grow and continue to, to ignite into greater and brighter things. 
You can go ahead and put the next one up. This is helping me to remember where I am in my notes, which aren't in front of me. <laughs> Um, the next thing was that Solomon wasn't faithful in the little things. So in Luke uh, 16, 10, it says, He who is, faith, who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is also unjust in much. I paraphrase that last part. I did not read that word for word. But <clears throat> Solomon, you know, with the horses and the chariots especially. Now, I don't know, to me, marrying 700 people is kind of a big deal, but I don't know, maybe it wasn't as much back then. I don't know. But this, but the thing of like buying a horse, buying a chariot, what's the big deal? But he wasn't faithful in things that were little or things that didn't seem to really matter. And I could just see Solomon's mind thinking about this, like, you know, the first horse he bought. Well, I know that the Bible, you know, I know God said, don't, multiply horses but you know i'm a king i should have a horse and i you know i could have a chariot and what's the harm in doing that like really what is that really going to do what is that you know and it's just that being faithful in the least sometimes god's called us to something or has said something to us that's like does that even matter like it's just not that big of a deal that's a, that's a statement that you'll also hear from like if preteens and teen, like, it's not a big deal. Can I just go to that party? Can I just <laughs> do this thing? It's not a big deal. And that's how these things work into our lives because we look at stuff. Now we're adults. We're the ones making our own decisions, choosing what's best for us. And we go, well, this thing, it's not a big deal. I know God, you know, God maybe gave me this conviction, but it's not that big a deal. And Jesus, you know, we use this a lot of times to talk about this verse, to talk about ministries. Like, oh, I want to do something big for God. Oh, but I better be faithful with the least. So no other I can do. I think that's true. But I also see this as just being like, are we just being faithful in the day to day? Because sometimes we just forget. Like, Solomon's probably thinking, I'm ruling this kingdom. I'm doing all, you know, the big stuff, right? But I'm just not, he's just not being faithful in these little things. Does that matter as long as I'm doing the big, right? Mm -hmm. But it's those little things that will eventually turn around and catch it so that the big will end up being gone and, and gone away. You can go to the next. So we see that he had... Uh, troubles with being faithful with little things. We see that he had troubles not doing the things he already knew to do. Um, this actually is a, I put this in here, catch us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. Song of Solomon is one of those books that's so poetic that you really have to understand poetry to be able to interpret it at all. But essentially, he's talking about relationships here in this verse, and he's saying, with the catch the catch us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, he's talking about the little tiny things that come in and destroy a relationship before you even know it. Now, Song of Solomon is a metaphor. While it has some great advice on, on how to have a good relationship with someone, like this is good relationship advice, right? Catch the little things, take care of the little things before they come in and spoil the relationship. Great relationship advice. The Bible is, is about our relationship with God. And so what this verse really is, is talking about catch those little things that can damage our relationship with God, right? Song of Solomon is written between the bride and her beloved. The beloved is Jesus. The bride is the church, you know, and that's really the metaphor that it stands for. In other words, this is written by Solomon giving the very advice that he's not taking. And that's kind of what I thought was ironic. You know, I put it in here, the very thing that he writes that's important to do is exactly what he's not doing. You can go on to the next. <laughs> um, so now we're going to talk about reliance on God. So we talked, to, we looked at the verses that was about the chariots and the horses, and we saw, saw that in Psalm, David said, some will trust in horses, some will trust in chariots, but we will trust in God. And so 
as those began to be multiplied, you stopped trusting in God. This is what Paul said about that, using less poetical language. So in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10, he says, And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast of my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, and reproaches, and needs, and persecutions, and distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And so you see Paul saying, hey, I, I like it better when I'm weak, because it's easier for me to rely on God. I can see the power of God moving in the areas that I don't know how to move in. But where I'm strong, it's harder because it's easier for me to rely on my own strength. And this is part of the trap that Solomon fell into, that as the blessings came and Israel began to grow in strength, Israel began to grow in reputation, Israel began to grow in number, Israel grew in wealth. What did they have left to have to trust in God for? They were strong in everything. We've got armies. We've got horses. We've got chariots. We've got all the money in the world. We have every resource available to us. If you ever go and read the whole passage of Solomon of in Kings here about Solomon and realize what their kingdom has, and it talks about like the wood, the gold, the uh, jewels, the spices. The, I mean, it's just like, you know, next level wealth that blows your mind. You're like, you, you kind of would look at this and go, well, of like you said, if you came to Solomon and you're and he entered into your small group and you're like, well, what would you like prayer for this week? And what's he going to ask for? I got everything. <laughs> like, and I'm, I'm on top of that, by the way, not to, you know, not to brag, but I'm the wisest man in the world. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like what, what is it, you know, so you get to this point, what does he need prayer for? What does he need to rely on God for? And that's the trap that we want to avoid because God didn't bless him so that he wouldn't have to rely on God. God blessed him to show that God is the king of his, the true king of Israel. But then suddenly Solomon takes it upon himself to believe, maybe I did this in my own strength. I'm the true king of Israel. And that's a mindset that we don't want to get into. Like we pray for God's blessing to come. And sometimes God's blessing doesn't come and look like something just sprinkled fairy dust on it and poof, it was there. Sometimes it looks like, oh, we ended up getting this job that we applied for. Sometimes God bless, God's blessing comes through very, very natural looking means. Does that mean it's not God's blessing? But do we remember that it's not God's blessing? <laughs> and we start to think, well, I did this. You know, there's some stuff it's very easy to give God credit for. If I pray for someone to be healed and they get healed, you know, like it would be really stupid for me to be like, oh yeah, you know, <laughs> I healed that person. I, got, I don't, you know, that doesn't even make sense. That has to be God through me doing that. Like that has to be. But like, you know, some things that seem a lot more natural that don't involve the supernatural does not negate God's blessing. But sometimes it's harder to see that in those areas. Um, you can go on to the next. <clears throat> so then the other thing that Solomon did that was wrong was he surrounded himself with ungodly people. And so by marrying all these women that the Bible in the Torah had forbidden him to do, marrying these people that God explicitly warned and said, if you do this, they will turn your hearts away from me. He does it anyways. And in Psalms 1, 1 through 2, I mean, this is like the very beginning of Psalms. You don't get more beginning than this. It says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners. That doesn't mean like standing in the way of sinners. It means like joining them in their path. Stands in the path of sinners. Nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And, his law, and in his law, he meditates day and night. So this is talking about, you know, how blessed we are when we don't listen to ungodly people and how blessed we are when we listen to the counsel of God that meditates on his law day and night is talking about listening to the counsel of God. What does his word say? That's how we're blessed. We're not blessed when we call on ungodly people to give us counsel. We're blessed when we listen to what the word of God says. Um, Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. And I know most people, 
if you've been in the church for any length of time, generally you've heard this verse at some point. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. And so this is about not trusting in our own selves, not trusting in our own wisdom, leaning into our own understanding. You know, we have this weird thing. We've been given the mind of Christ, but that's inside of us. And so sometimes people, I think, have a hard time differentiating. But I hear people all the time, how do I know if I'm hearing the voice of God or if I'm hearing my own self? You know, and, and that's kind of this weird thing of how we're built because our, our brain has to physically interpret the thoughts and things that are happening. So there's this interaction between our body and our soul and our spirit. You know, because our spirit is where the mind of Christ is and he's communing with us and talking to us one-on-one. But then that has to enter into our mind, which is part of our soul, and into our brain, which is part of our body, for it all be processed. And so it gets, you know, we can get confused. So how do we know when we're trusting in our own understanding or if we're leaning onto the wisdom of God? And the answer to that is simply, um, where are we right now? In other words, are we walking in the Spirit? Are we listening to God, meditating on Him, being in Him? Or are we pursuing after our own flesh at the time that we're thinking about these things and making these decisions? Because whichever one we're plugged into, if we're plugged into the Spirit and we're listening to the Spirit, that's going to be from the mind of Christ. But if we're pursuing our own flesh and going after our own ways where we've cut off that flow from the Spirit coming through us. We haven't destroyed it. Our spirit still is existing and intacting, but we've shut off our body listening to it and responding to our spirit, and now we're listening to our flesh. So that's kind of how we end up doing that. So uh, bringing it into the New Testament, Paul, who just states things without poetical (laughs) words, he just says, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Like, plain and simple, if you're hanging around ungodly people, guess what? You're going to eventually be influenced by them. You know, they always have the, I don't know if anyone's ever seen the thing where it's like, is it harder to pull people up or down? And they'll say, like, have someone stand on a chair. We won't do this with uh, John and Terry's furniture, especially since they're not here. But to have, like, someone stand on a chair and someone stand on the floor, and then you hold hands and tell each of them to try to pull the other one to where they are. Well, it's really hard to pull someone up onto a chair, and it's not that hard to pull someone off a chair and onto the floor, right? And that's kind of what this verse is talking about. It's unlikely that just by hanging around evil people that you will bring them up. Only God can do that. We don't do that just by hanging out with them. Like, God has to do something. Now, we can bring the presence of God. I'm not saying don't ever... You know, we can bring the presence of God, but it's more likely that if that's the, if that's who we surround ourselves with all the time, that we're going to be brought down way more likely we're going to be brought down than they're going to be brought up. And so that's why there's warnings about that in the Bible. I'm not just making that up. That's, you know, bringing that straight out of scripture. We like to think, but I'm strong. I'm the exception. And I bet you Solomon thought that, (laughs) you know, and yet. And yet, all right. Oh, yeah. Hey, so I'm at my uh, ending points. So the question that we have is, how do we not fall into the same trap as Solomon? How do we prevent ourselves from becoming distanced as time goes on, distanced from God? And the best way to keep near to God is to remember his promises. So remember, with Solomon, he read those promises things from God, the different promises, the different commands in the Torah. Remember his promises, but he forgot them and he didn't abide by them. We want to keep in a relationship with him. In other words, praying, meditating, reading his word so that we understand and know him better and being in fellowship with believers who are also pursuing God. So I had a couple of things that I was going to say out of my own life where I've seen these things in action. Um, I remember when Tina and I first got married, we had uh, two different convictions that we decided to put together into one. So I was, I had a conviction that I would never see or watch any movie 
with nudity in it. I just had decided that that wasn't good for me where I was. I didn't need that. So that was going to be my conviction. Tina had one that she felt God had told her to never watch a rated R movie, which didn't necessarily, not all rated R movies have nudity in them. So that, so they became, you know, and also there are non-rated R movies with me. So we, they became even more limited. So the amount of movies that we were able to watch became very small. Um, but we had this conviction. Well, we've actually stayed true to that conviction for the most part. And we have broken it a couple times, but, but when we have broken it, we have not made a habit and said like, well, we broke this, we might throw in the towel, <laughs> you know. The Christ. We did watch The Passion of the Christ, which was rated R. I don't really count that one because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was, a, however, we did watch The Matrix, so, um, which I loved. But, what's that? Yeah, it is rated R, yes. Um, it's a little, pretty, uh, pretty good, pretty good amount of violence in that movie. Yeah. So anyways, you know, what I was saying is, but, but I still, we still to this day end up, and there's been a lot of movies that we've had pressure from people to see. In fact, I ran into a situation with one of my pastors. So back when I worked at Redeemer Church, uh, one of our pastor, well, the pastor that's there now is Sean Yost. And he has a movie that he just thinks is the best movie in the world ever, bar none. And he wanted to use it as sermon examples all the time. Hmm. And one of the things that he wanted me to do, because I was the media director, is one, there was one sermon that he wanted to sort of base on, is Braveheart, by the way. And Braveheart, as most people don't know, is rated R. And it's probably a great movie, you know, like, but I've never seen it. And so, but he wanted me to get the movie, watch through the movie and, lo- and line it up with points from his sermon to point, to bring out clips that we could use. And now I had to face this thing. I had committed to God that I would not watch a rated R movie. My boss, who is also my pastor, is now telling me to watch this movie. That probably isn't bad, <laughs> you know, because he kept using it in sermon examples. I don't know how bad it could be. But what do I do? Mm. Coupled with that is probably the enemy, but in the back of my head saying, you know you did this once because you watched The Matrix. Mm. And what do I do? But I remembered, and I decided to go talk to my pastor about it, and I said, hey, I had to, because, you know, he was my boss. (laughs) You can't just... This, it's one thing to just decide not to do something. Another thing to decide not to do something that your boss has told you, you better talk to him, yeah. right? So I go and talk to him and I was like, here's the deal. And I explained to him that, and then once he heard my conviction, he was like, "Never mind. We don't. it's not that important that we have those clips in the thing. And he stopped bringing that up to me. Mm-hmm. So that was great. He was a good, you know, he was a good, he's a great guy. And I, it, I knew that wouldn't be an issue. It's not like, yeah. but I did need to talk to him about it. But the point of that wasn't how good Sean is. The point of that was there was this conviction of something that I knew to do. And this isn't a conviction that's given to everyone. This isn't a conviction. Like, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that's how you live a godly life. That's not a scripture. That's not a Bible. Like, that's that's your own conviction. That's you and God. You know, that's something God gave to us as a married couple. Um, Then the other one was about how about being around ungodly people? And I remember now I never really have hung out with a whole lot of people that are just bad people or ungodly people or whatever. Like that's not really been my MO. I I grew up in the church. I went to a Christian school for most of my life until I went to um, Stewart and Forrest. But before that I had gone to an only Christian school and then I was, you know, just, sort of stayed sort of in this bubble of very protected innocence. So that wasn't really a thing, but I did. But as it turns out, most of the people that I hung out with were very, what I would say, worldly Christians. You know, they're like, hey, we love God, but we never talk about him. You know, it's just, you know, yeah, we go to church on Sundays and that's it. And I was fine with that. And what I found is that the majority of my life, most of my conversations consisted of 
you know, how good the Gators are doing, what's the best food, what's a good restaurant, you know, what's a great movie that I can actually watch, <laughs> what's, what's on TV, you know, just stuff, just general stuff. And then when I joined Grace Church, I uh, started hanging out with people like Tim Downey and uh, Amy and some other people. And it was like, they're just constantly talking about what God's doing in their life and how good he is and different things. And then they would all of a sudden switch to talking about which, you know, who makes the best pizza in Jacksonville. And then all of a sudden it's back to God and something else about Jesus. And then this, and it's just interwoven in. And the more that I hung out with them, it started to bleed into me and it started to bleed into our marriage and our relationship. And we found that all of a sudden we were doing that. And all of a sudden we started finding that our spiritual lives began to really grow and mature and take off into a way that it hadn't before. And what was the difference? The difference wasn't, I didn't change how much quiet time I was having, how much Bible study I was reading, how much I attended church. I was doing all of those things in spades. What changed was who I was hanging out with. And so there's, there's, it's almost like God put that in the Bible for a reason. <laughs> it's, yeah, right. You know, it's like that. And then what was the last one thing that I had up there? Now I can't remember. Oh, being, well, being in fellowship with believers, but also keeping in that relationship with him. Who are pursuing God? Yeah. So, so yeah, being in fellowship with believers who are also pursuing God. The reason I did that is because I was in fellowship with believers, but they weren't specifically pursuing God. When it changed that I was with people who were like actually pursuing God, then that's when I saw that real change. Now, if you're hanging out with non-believers and also you just switch to believers, you'll also see a change there too. Um, but then also this keeping in a relationship with him, like not forgetting who he is, you know, praying, meditating, reading his word. There's this thing about just staying in constant relationship and communication with God. I believe like when we look at Solomon, when were his two visitations from God? At the very beginning, like at, like at his inauguration, basically. The first one came right before he was made king. The second one came just after he was made king. The third time he experienced God was at the blessing of the temple, which was like within the first years of his, I don't know how long it took to build the temple, but he started on it pretty immediately. It was done. When was his fall? When he was old. Like there's no record of any visitations from God, of any communion with God, of him talking to any of the prophets of Israel. There's no record of him doing anything with God between the temple and his fall. We just, there is none. And what I am extrapolating from that, because also his entire life is summed up into a couple chapters, you know, so we don't have everything. But what I'm extrapolating from that is that he stopped really pursuing God. He stopped really desiring and looking at who God is and wanting that relationship with him. I think I have a verse in Corinthians from Paul, hopefully, maybe. Oh, that's the one about, I already did that one. <laughs> but there should be a long one, a very, very long passage, maybe. No, okay, maybe I didn't put it. I thought it was the last verse, but you know, when I don't have my notes, oh, I said it was too long, so I didn't put it in my notes. That stinks, because now I don't have it. We'll see how far I can get on this. I probably can't. I'm not even going to try. You know the address? We can read it. I'll just, no, I don't remember the address. It's in, it's, it, no, it's in Philippians 3. Anyways, Paul basically says this. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. If by somehow I may attain to the resurrection of the dead, um, but at some point, whether that was before or after, he said, all these things that I counted that were once gained to me, I now count as rubbish in pursuit of the knowing, of the growing knowledge of Christ. Mm -hmm. Essentially, just read Philippians 3 at some point. You'll find all this in there. <laughs> I forget, it's all jumbled up in my head right now. But the point of what Paul was saying is, I want to put the world behind me. And I want to know Christ. And I want to know everything about Christ. I want to pursue Christ with a reckless ambition that just puts everything that I've ever gained to the side and says, this isn't even worth anything. 
because just the knowledge of Christ is what I want. That was his thing. He says he has a goal. His goal is the upward calling of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. That's how he sort of ends that passage. And Paul is saying, if I just continue to pursue God for my entire life, and what's he talking about? Like, what's pursuing God? It's being his word, praying, meditating. It's being around godly people. It's all these things. He's like, that's my end goal. Well, I can tell you with someone who has that as their end goal, that's putting that into practice, they're not going to fall into the trap that Solomon fell into because they're constantly looking at his, at who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. So the way that we grow old and don't flame out, the way that we continue to pursue God throughout our entire life is we can look at, at Solomon and then basically do the opposite. <laughs> that's a poor yeah, I know poor Solomon but he brought it on himself but it's you know it's that keep the things that we already know to do what are the basic commandments that God has given us what are the things that he wrote in his word and told us like you don't outgrow that like we don't mature past the first things God has ever told us to do right that's number one number two is who are we surrounding ourselves with what is the company that we're keeping because the more that we're around people, and like if our goal, like Paul, is to know God better, the more people we're around who have that same goal, the more that that's going to happen to us. And then the third thing is staying in that constant connection with God that I am actually pursuing. Not only hanging out with people who pursue, but I want to pursue them so that I'm one of those people other people want to hang out with, you know, to raise them up, right? So... That's where I'm looking at with Solomon, and that is, there we go, this, the, uh, how to avoid the stupidity of the wisest man on the earth. <laughs> so, um, Father, we just thank you so much for the word that you've given to us. We're thankful for your promises, for your presence that's in us. Lord, we pray that you will help us to continue to look at you, to keep you ever before our eyes and to pursue you with everything that is in us. Lord, we exalt you and we bless your name. Amen.